Let's continue honoring all of our veterans this morning. Yes, let's honor them. Let's give it up for them. I don't know if you recognize the pictures, but they serve here with us. They're our brothers from our church. So let's give it up for one more time for them. Thank you so much for uh, all of our veterans, not just the ones here, but the ones watching us for your servitude and for your boldness and courage and to honor our country and to honor, uh, uh, fight for our freedom. So right now, if there's any veterans in this auditorium, can you please rise so you're honored? Thank you so much for your boldness and your courage and for fighting for our country. We are giving you our hearts of gratitude this morning. I want to ask you to please remain standing. And those around them, I want you to stretch your arms and we're going to be praying for them this morning. We're going to honor them for what they have done through our prayers. So, Father God, right now we thank you, Lord, for this men and women, Father, who have fought for our country, God, Father God. I pray, Father, your blessing over them. Bless them, Father God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for their boldness and for their courage, God. There's trauma going on from those times, Father. I don't know it, but you do. So right now I pray for your spirit to be with them, God, in those times. Be with their families, Father, of the ones who have lost a veteran. Right now we thank you, Father for their lives and for what they have done for our country. We bless them in the name of Jesus. May your spirit be with them to the end of their days. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be Amen, amen. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to our veterans once again. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Happy to be in the house once again. Amen. Amen. Well, my name is Pastor David Mendoza. For those of you who don't know me, I am the campus pastor here at the West Echo TFC campus. Absolute pleasure to be with you guys once again. And I do want to take a moment before I go too much further to welcome those joining us via our Facebook live stream. Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, today's actually uh, the start of something new that I'm doing for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm starting a new series, a new ser series of conversations about a topic which I think is important to talk about. If you've been following anything that I've been doing these last few weeks, I've been talking a lot about trials and the kind of things that happen to us in the middle of trials. Uh, we had a, many conversations. Pastor Carl, my wife, were up here and we were talking about how our faith is supposed to be sustaining and walking us through even the valleys. Uh, that's okay. You know, that happens. 2020 happened no matter who you are. And that's okay. Our faith is equipped for that. So I'm going to be digging a little bit into that. And for that, I'm going to give you one quick tip. I have a lot to kind of cover today. I always say the same thing, but I hope you hear me. It is a little bit of a different message today. I always say that, but you're going to see why in a moment. So right where you are, if I can ask something of you, as I dig in today, I encourage you guys to write stuff down. Uh, I can't, it won't be one of those messages that is just kind of really packaged and, and, and with a nice bow on top and everything will make sense. I encourage you, have you something to write with, bust out your phone, a uh, piece of paper, something to write with, take some notes. I encourage you to do that. Be careful because the moment you bust out your phone, a notification will come in and you'll get distracted. Uh, but just set those aside, focus on this, and I encourage you over these next few weeks, write stuff, make sure you have your scripture with you so we can actually dig a little bit into that together. Amen. So for today, let's go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. It's going to be the verse I used to launch today's conversation. And it says this in 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. Three things will last forever. Everybody pay attention to this. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So today's conversation, today's sermon, I'm entitling an overlooked essential. An overlooked essential essential. So let's go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you once again for the opportunity, Dad, to be here. Thank you for this time together in community and in fellowship. Father, I pray that, Father, we have soft hearts and pliable spirits to receive your word, to be transformed by it, to learn something new in your name today so we can see you in a different way, in a new way, and fall deeper and deeper in love with you. We love you for who you are. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, has, has anybody ever read this verse before? Just show of hands real quick. You've seen this verse a couple of times before. Pretty powerful verse. It says there's three things that are going to last forever. Faith, hope, and love. If you haven't actually read this scripture before, it's actually part of 1 Corinthians 13, which is actually, uh, I'm not sure it's actually called that. I just call it that. It's called the love chapter. 
If you've ever been to a wedding, I've done several weddings before, that's the one you hear all the time because it actually talks about how love is patient, love is kind. And I read that and the bride and the groom look at each other and they're like, oh, we're going to be together forever, right? That kind of thing. Because it's a love chapter. So it's a very famous, popular chapter that you see everywhere. But it closes with verse 13, which I think is so interesting. Paul, kind of writing this letter, sums it up by saying, hey guys, there's going to be three things that last forever. It's going to be faith, hope, and love. Now, my, the heart behind this entire series uh, and the heart behind what I'm going to be doing these next few weeks is that I feel, as a congregation, we spend a lot of time talking about love. Uh, that's okay. Love is important. My, my, one of my defining verses in Scripture for me has always been uh, love God and love neighbor. That's been just one of the things that I've always kind of uh, shaped my life. It's ingrained in my teaching. So love God, love neighbor. That's, I always talk about love. We've got to love people. Amen. Uh, we talk about faith. Every, every week we talk about putting our faith in Jesus, putting our faith in God and what he's done through Christ on the cross. And as a result, we have this. We have the promises of God and this is how it looks. So we talk a lot about faith and we talk about a, lot, a lot about love. But how much do we talk about hope? Hope. Uh, I wanted to spend some time on that because I think hope is just this thing that is so important. It's actually on the list. It's going to last forever. <laughs> and we need to have hope, especially in times of trial. Hope changes things. Hope is important. But I find that in the society that we live in, hope isn't really much more than like a wish. Uh, maybe you're getting hungry already because it's already 12.15 and you're like, I hope that the taqueria is open. I wish. That's just a wish, right? You don't know. I mean, what are you basing that off of? You just say, I hope. Uh, if you're a Cowboy fan, I hope the Cowboys will beat the, the undefeated Steelers today at 7-0. <laughs> you can't base that on anything, especially not on the way they play. It's just a wish. You're just wishing that it happens. Uh, that's the way the word hope is used in our society. It's almost just like a wish. I hope this happens. I hope I get that raise. I hope I get this. I hope I get that. It's just a wish. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is much greater than that. It's much more important, it's much more weighty, and it's much more transformational. Hope is a big deal. Uh, there was a psychologist who would um, counsel married couples, and he had actually a, a track record of talking to married couples who were just riddled with problems. They had a lot of problems on them, and uh, every time they'd come to see him, he would talk to them and meet with them frequently, and then they would turn it around. Somehow this guy was just, he was doing very well. People kind of knew, if you have issues, go see him and he'll help you. So they interviewed him later and they said, hey, how are you doing that? How are you transforming those lives? How are you helping those people turn their marriage around after 30 years, after 20 years or whatever? And the psychologist actually said something very powerful, which I want to kind of say now before I move on. He said, uh, I actually don't do anything too crazy. I try to implement 10% change in their life. That's it, just 10% change. Or maybe treat each other better, maybe go to church more, maybe read scripture more, just 10% change. And when they do that, uh, it starts to work and something happens. They start getting hope. Hope. They believe it can change. And once hope comes in, anything is possible. Powerful, right? That's very powerful. Like, I want you to, I, I, I've had a first row chair to see this play out at this young campus. This campus has been here for around five years now. Uh, I've been pastoring here for a while, and I've had the opportunity to see how that looks. People come into this church, maybe their family has a history of bad marriages or bad relationships. Everybody in there is divorced. Everybody in there is on their third or fourth spouse, and they're having trouble. And they come to a place like this, and we preach the gospel, and maybe they meet a couple who is actually killing it in marriage, uh, who's cheesy, who's loving in each other, and all this. And they're like, that's interesting. So that's possible. And like, yeah, that's possible. How'd they do that? They did a couple of things and they start to implement change. And all of a sudden it starts to work, right? They start seeing some changes and hope starts to rise. It might be a little bit in the beginning. Those of you who have experienced this know what I'm talking about, right? It might be a little bit in the beginning, but as you get hope that things can get better, it kind of snowballs. And if you have hope, anything is possible. That's just the way scripture is. Hope allows you to, it frees you from your past because you know some things can be different. It allows you to dream because you're not just worried about what has happened, you're looking at what will happen. Hope is very, very powerful. But today, I wanted to spend some time talking to the believers in the house. And if you're not a believer and follower of Jesus, I'm glad that you're here as well. I'm going to speak to you as well. But this is going to kind of have an overtone of scripture for people who are following or looking to follow Jesus. Because it actually says in... Uh, Ephesians 2, bring it up on the screen, Ephesians 2.12, this is important. In those days, this is Paul talking about believers before they knew Jesus. He says, in those days you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them, you lived in this world without God and without 
hope. Prior to God, and this, this is why I wanted to bring up the scripture. If you're here under the sound of my voice and you are a follower of Jesus, you're a believer of Jesus Christ, can you raise your hand for me? All right. We're, like, we're, like, we're batting 100 here. Everybody here is a follower of Jesus. Praise God. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Scripture is telling you if you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to live a life with hope. Amen. Not without it. And the reason why I wanted to spend a few weeks on this topic is because I found, and maybe you'll agree with me on this, I found that as we've been walking in 2020, uh, life has kind of taken a bit of a nosedive in so many areas, in in, in health and money and relationship, and you're having issues. And what happens during those times, I find, and this is my heart, my, my burden, I find that believers are walking without hope. And that's not what we're called to do. We're called to have hope. So today, I actually wanted to spend some time on this whiteboard and do something a little bit different. That's why I said I wanted, you to make, I wanted to make sure you write some stuff down. I want to talk about hope. But I want to talk about biblical hope and what it actually looks like in our life. So I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. Write a few of these down if you don't have them or if, uh, maybe for a little bit of a later follow-up. And then I'm going to draw some stuff on the board and we'll have a chat. Okay? Actually, after the first service, by the way, after the first service, somebody sent me a picture of their drawing. They drew it all out. It's so, it's so, so funny. It was cute. And... Uh, <laughs> Pause. I'm talking fast. I'm excited to get the content out, but I want to share something. I was really emotional after the first service. I don't know why. Something that I'm doing here today, at least in the first service, I don't know if I can share that. At least in the first service, shifted something in some people. It seems so basic, but honestly, it's not basic, and it's so powerful if you get a hold of it. So I encourage you, press in. I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to be cracking the jokes. I'm not going to be yelling. I'm going to just teach some things. But press into that in the name of Jesus. Amen. John 3, 16, 17, a very well-known verse we all know. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Everybody here under the sound of my voice, I believe, is called to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of what he's done for us, we're offered forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. We're given the Holy Spirit power in our lives to walk with us every day of our life. We're promised eternity, and we're just given all of that day one. (laughs) That's just who he is. That's how good God is. Day one, you come to faith in Jesus. This is yours because that is who God is. Amen? Amen? So this is all given to you because of the cross. But like I said, you have the forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. You have uh, all these things that God has done for you, the Holy Spirit power. And I also mentioned that you also have uh, a future, which is an eternity in heaven. By the way, I'm actually doodling. Forgive me my little doodles, but it'll make sense in a moment. Uh, These are supposed to be the pearly gates of heaven. You see, it's a cloud. See? It's a cloud. And they're shiny. (laughs) All right? The pearly gates of heaven. You're given forgiveness of sin, you're given all that stuff, and you're also giving an eternity in heaven. Let's not move on too fast from that. You might live on this world 60 to 70 years, 80 years if you're lucky, 100 years like my grandmother. I mean, she was, she was almost immortal. Uh, <laughs> my great-grandmother, she lived like 100 and something, right? Yeah, a century. It was great. Like, yeah, we had her around forever, and God's faithful. Some of you might live that long, <laughs> but maybe not all of them. But here's the, the difference between this life and eternity. Eternity goes on forever. This finishes. So let's, never, let's not miss that. Because of Christ, come on, because of the forgiveness of sin, because of who he is, we have the Holy Spirit power and we're promised eternity in heaven. Not because we're good, because he's good. Amen. That's just the way it is. That's, it. That's, that's scripture, okay? So I'm going to do some teaching. All right, but let's pay attention to what actually happens uh, in Colossians verses, chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. You're going to see the three things that I said last forever. Faith, hope, and love. You remember that? Faith, hope, and love? Read with me in Colossians. We always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people, which comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you where? In heaven. You have have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Real quick, I'm doing a little bit of teaching, but I hope you follow. Paul is introducing a letter, and he says, hey, because you have faith in Jesus, because I can see your love, and because you have hope that you have an eternity in heaven because of this, uh, you should understand that. You know this, right? Basically, this is what he's saying. 
And, and today's lesson, as I'm kind of walking through it, the reason why I'm walking through it is because I'm not sure if everybody actually knows this. Uh, when I say that we're walking in tough times and I see believers walking around with no hope, it tells me something is off. And, and I wanted to spend some time talking about that. So because we have faith, because we've been forgiven, because Jesus Christ, because God does not abandon us and will be with us on our journey, we're all assured heaven together for an eternity. That's scripture. That's just basic gospel teaching. Can I get an amen? amen. But today I want to talk about what it actually looks like from here until then. So if I were to draw a line from the moment you were saved to the day that the Lord calls you home, would it be a straight line? All right. Would it be a, uh, the first service somebody yelled that out? It was great. It will be a crazy line. <laughs> thought it was great. Like, yes, audience participation. Amen. Uh, would it be a straight line? I'm going to dig into this, but would it look like this? You're saved. And then from that moment, whenever that is, your life is just going to get, go higher and higher up and to the right, and everything's going to go well for a 45-degree increase all the way into eternity. No. Come on. Like, come on. Like, okay. <laughs> all right, pause, pause. Very few people in the first service and very few people here are going to agree with me that that's what's happening. That when we're saved, it's up and to the right. Up and to the right. Everything's good, our job, our health. We're only going to die because we're so perfectly fit that our body's just going to give out. <laughs> no, right? No, we, we, most people will agree with me here that the moment we're saved to the moment we reach eternity will not be a straight, perfect, always getting better life. Yeah. Amen? You know how I know that? Because 2020 happened. Right. Yeah. Let's, not, let's not go that far. Trials and temptations and things will come. I want to make sure that I draw this out because very few people will agree with me that that's what, that's what you expect. But a lot of people live as if that's what they believe. They're, they're li I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm going to church. I'm tithing. Woo, I'm practically glowing with the holiness that I got. <laughs> and then something hits you and your response is, why God? Why? Why is this happening to me? I thought my life was supposed to go up and to the right until glory. <laughs> See, it's important. I don't want to move on fast. It's important. Very few people will agree that they believe that, but a lot of people live as if they do. Right. So when trial comes, they, what, what, why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. Yeah. Yeah. I should be going up and to the right, up and to the right. But then life goes right into the down, <laughs> into the bottom. And you're like, wait a second. No, that's not supposed to happen to me. I'm a believer. All right. So I think you guys are following. This is a smart crowd, by the way. You guys are smart. <laughs> Woo. Praise God. <laughs> All right. So if it's not supposed to look like that, then what does it look like? All right. You guys are getting it. I love it. It's going to look like this. Woo. Yay. Can we agree to that? All right, oh, this is going to be so much fun. We agree to that, okay. We find Jesus, and there's, life, there's times in life where things are just clicking, right? Your job, there's money in the bank, your relationships are going fine, everything's going well, but then life takes a turn, like 2020, jobs are lost, uh, health crisis, election or whatever, circumstances tighten around you, and that's just the way of life, amen? That's just the way it is. I want to spend some time talking about what hope looks like if we understand this. If this is what we believe, what does hope look like in that? So what I'm going to do is, if, uh, I hope this makes sense. If this is our life, the moment we find Christ, and this is the moment we get to heaven, because eventually that's what I'm saying. If you're a follower of Jesus, no matter what happens, hear me, no matter what happens in this life, you're assured eternity. <laughs> Praise God. No matter what happens. But if, I'm, if this is what we believe, I want to do this. I want to zoom in to part of our life right now. Just this one section, and I'm going to call it 2020. Okay? 2020. That's 2020. Because a lot of us are in that boat. We're like, yay, everything's great. Everything's awesome. 2020 is going to be our year. It's going to be the year of perfect vision, 2020. Ha ha, we're funny. It's going to be great. And then, oh, well, I heard there was a little virus. What's going on? Oh, no, it's March. Oh, no, it's still June, and we're still in this. The kids are going to go back to school. I'm not too sure. I got laid off. I'm not sure I'm getting the job back. Oh, no, it should be done by the end of summer, right? We'll be back to normal back then. Oh, no, we're not even sure we're going to have Thanksgiving now. And it just kind of took a dive. 
Come on. What does that look like in our life? So let me zoom into that, if I may. Okay, you, you, some of you guys are writing this down. Some of you guys in first service drew it out. So remember this. I'm going to extrapolate it and make it a little bit bigger to see if we can get some learning today. So here's a bigger scale of 2020. Okay? Here's what I find. Follow me on this. I believe there's people in the house today who have a relationship with Jesus and have in their life experienced what I like to call mountaintop experiences with God. Where all of a sudden things are going well, God loves you, your relationships were fine, your relationship with God was just clicking, and you had everything going in your direction, mountaintop experiences. Has anybody had this before? Praise God, I've had these before. Where man, you pray and God answers. And, and you move and God, and, and like all of a sudden there's money in the bank. I, I mean, I've, I've been in situations in life where money just shows up, and I don't even need it, but God just, here you go. And I'm like, wow, God is awesome, mountaintop, right? We all want the mountaintop. Uh, but if this is 2020, let's just say our life is like this, we're doing fine, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves on the downswing, and here we are in 2020. Things not going like we expect, the election, racial injustices, fires, I mean, you name it, right? Everybody's been pounded in 2020. As a pastor, my experience tells me that there's, there's, whenever we find ourselves in this situation, there's a response from people. And here's what I normally find. Maybe you're in the house today. Maybe you've done this. If, if the shoe fits, dance in it. Uh, but if, you know, it, you might be you. So I want you to press into this. If that's you and you're having a rough patch and maybe you're not on a mountaintop, maybe life isn't going like you expect, normally there's two responses that I find as a pastor happen a lot. Response number one. I don't want to do this anymore. It's not working. I'm going to go back to the way I was. That's response number one. Response number one is not necessarily quitting, but basically, yeah, I'm going to say quit. I don't want to do this anymore. I tried the faith thing. It didn't work out. I'm going to go back to the things that I've always done because I tried to have faith. Even though I messed up my marriage for 10 years, I tried to go to church for two weeks and it didn't work. So I'm quitting this. I'm going to go back. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to step outside of the will of God. I'm not going to listen to his word. I'm not going to go to the church. I'm just going to do life my way. By the way, I didn't say this in the first service. I'll say it in this one. If that's you and you've decided to go back and do life your own way, I can't guarantee any of those. (laughs) Because then if you're rejecting Jesus and who he is in your life, I don't know what you're tethered to. (laughs) Okay? Just FYI. And maybe maybe I'll dig in a little bit more into that in a moment. That's one response. I'm just going to go back. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm out. Another common response I find from believers is this other response. I'm here, but I wish I was here. I'm having a rough year, but man, 2019 was pretty good. 2018, you remember how we had faith then and how the Lord moved then? This happens a lot in church circles. Uh, we can, you, you might come to a place like this and say, man, when, when, Westlake, when TFC Westlake first opened, man, it was just fire. And it was going great, but you know, it's been different. Things have changed. Yeah, that's okay. Things have changed. But it's funny, when we're in the trial, that your usual response is to go back and quit because it didn't go the way we wanted, or to try to relive something that has already passed. And, and that one's more for believers, I find. A lot of believers, they, they, there's like a, and maybe this is you in the house, if the shoe fits dance, right? There's like a golden age of your faith. There's a time in your life when, you, when faith felt good and when it felt comfortable and when God was answering and when things were just going well. And, and we can, if we're not careful, we can hold on to that too tightly and try to relive it and not be aware of what's happening now. Those are the general responses. We quit, we relive. I'm going to offer a third alternative. Okay? Remember, we just zoomed into the greater thing. I'm going to offer a third alternative. And here's the third one. If we're here, and you're having a rough year, and you're having a rough patch, maybe you're not called to go back. I don't don't even have to say maybe. You're not. (laughs) Scripture says, if you have your hand to the plow, don't look back. No looking back, church. If you're here, and you want to relive, gently, pastorally, and with all the love in the world, (laughs) those days are over. We're not called to live on our past faith. We can learn from it, we can grow from it, but we're not called to experience it every single day. Okay? So we're not going back, we're not going to relive, so what are we going to do? Here's the third option. Forward. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, because of who God is and because of what he's done, we can guarantee you that one day, hear me, one day you will be here. On the upswing again. I'm going to show you in scripture where that is. Uh, Give me a minute, but I want you to see it first. And if you're here and you know you will be here eventually, what happens is that hope fills all this in. (laughs) Hope. You can be in a free fall. You can be in a free fall, but because you know that something greater is coming and because you know the faithfulness of God that will lead you into eternity, you can live even in a downswing knowing the upswing is coming. And when you do that, that fills that space with hope. Uh, as a pastor, I've had a first row chair, and it's an absolute blessing to be here with you guys, man. I just love being your pastor, but I've learned so much from you, as I hope you've learned from me. Uh, I've seen this play out, this idea of like, I have hope because I know something greater is coming, even in the middle of circumstance. Anybody know believers like that? Yeah. That even though their life's falling apart, they're like, this is fine. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord's good. It's going to be fine. Uh, I've seen that play out in so many different scenarios, but the one that came to mind earlier today, and I'm going to pause this, I want to show you this. There was a gentleman that I knew who was part of our congregation who did that little downswing, uh, that little whoop, and it was right at the end of his life. I didn't know it was the end of his life. This gentleman was part of our congregation, and he was, he was part of it. He served here. He, we loved him dearly, a dear, dear friend of ours, and his life was going great. Everything was clicking, and then all of a sudden, he found himself in a disease, <laughs> A heart disease, (laughs) a horrible disease. And and we found ourselves praying with him and talking to him. And I was like, you know, we're going to believe and we're going to stand with you in prayer. And we're going to do these things. And we're going to believe that God has greater days ahead for you. And he's like, yeah, I know. (laughs) And he was real hopeful. And I was like, no, you're going to be fine. He's like, no, it actually might be my time to die. And I was like, are you like, what are you talking about? In the name of Jesus, no, right? You're not going to die. What are you talking about? He's like, you know what? When I get to heaven, and I'm not making this up. When I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to God about how good you are. (laughs) That's what he told me. And I was like, you're not going to get to heaven, dude. Shake it off. (laughs) You're going to be fine. We're going to pray with you. See, he knew that although his body was deteriorating, he was going to be in an upswing eventually. So he made that bridge. And whenever I talked to him, everything that came out of his mouth was hope. No matter what tubes he was tied to. (laughs) And at the end of the day, this this is almost an extreme example, but I want you to see. He passed away. And he entered into eternity not ever flinching about knowing where he was going. Everybody else doubted. I hope you get better. You'll be fine. You're still young. And he's like, I know where I'm going. I know there's better days ahead. And sure enough, he passed away. And I experienced what it's like to walk through sickness full of hope, knowing that something greater is coming. That's extreme. That's like the end of life. But notice, how many of these little ups and downs are you going to have in your life? So, let's go to Scripture. I'm not making this up. Okay, David, that's a lot of talk. Show me where it says that in Scripture. All right, here we go. Go with me to 1 Peter 3 through 7. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7. I'm going to read. It's a long section of Scripture. Uh, If you have your phone with you, write it down. If not, you can always take pictures of the screen if you want to remember it later. It's a long section of Scripture. I'm reading four four, four verses. But as I'm reading them, I want you to, eyes on me, eyes on me. As I'm reading them, I want you to remember everything I just said. Okay? Remember the little squigglies and see how it's represented in Scripture. You ready? Here we go. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. One translation says hope. We live with hope. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Did you see that? I'm going to repeat that again. Through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive it. The journey, basically. Verse 6. So be truly glad. 
There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. <clears throat> 2020. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tastes, tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far from more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. <laughs> praise God. Let me give you a working definition of what I believe hope to be. Write this down. Faith is our complete trust and confidence in God. Biblical hope is built on faith. Hope is the earnest anticipation that comes with believing something good is coming. Here's the crux of the message. If you are a follower of Jesus in the house today, and I had you, com you know, confess it with your hand. <laughs> if that's you, are you living as if better times are ahead? Because that's what it's asking. Are you living with the hope that there is something better ahead? Let me phrase it a different way. Do you truly believe that better days are in front of you than behind you? It's a challenging question. But you know why I ask it? Because if you raise your hand, you're supposed to. <laughs> you're supposed to believe there's better days ahead. You're supposed to live with hope, not a wish, an anticipation, knowing that God will do exactly what he says he has done. He will give you eternity, and he will walk with you from the moment you receive him until the moment you arrive. He will be with you through the ups and through the downs, and your life is not meant to be like everybody else's life because you have him, because you have him. That's the kind of life that we're supposed to live. I said what I titled this, this sermon series over these next few weeks, and I want to say it one more time. I called these next few sermons a series called Let's, Let Hope Rise. Let Hope Rise. And my pastoral heart, my, my, uh, the reason why I wanted to share this is because as I've been digging through 2020, as I've been walking with, through, with, with you guys through 2020, I've been doing funerals. I've, I've had the gamut. I've, I've prayed for people. I've done funerals. I've married and I've buried <laughs> I've married people. I've buried people. I've, I've gone through so many things. There's a trend that I'm noticing, and this is, I hope this isn't, it's going to sting a little bit. There's a trend. The way the believers that I'm seeing are carrying themselves doesn't differentiate them from the rest of the world. Their words are also hopeless, as if they don't understand what they've been given. There's no hope. And what I'm saying today is that if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, you're called to live with hope. You're called to live with an expectation, not a wish, not a hope. I, just, I wish that it would just come back better. No, no, no. We have an assurance that better days are ahead. Just like my friend, even at his death, he knew that better days were ahead. So I want to give you one final phrase that I, hope, I wanted to give you something to walk away with that you can put in your pocket. I encourage you to write this down because, as I said, I've been thinking about this, praying about this for this congregation and for everybody here and watching online. I was trying to find a way to explain this and say, okay, let's really talk about this. Uh, if you're struggling in this area, and the reason why I ask is because I know there's a lot of people struggling in this area of hope. They have faith, they love God, but they can't see far into the future, so they think it's bad. Uh, if that's you, I want to give you a phrase that I want you to put into your pocket. I want you to write down. I want you to remember as you struggle with it because it'll help you. And here it is. When you're struggling with hope, when you're struggling looking ahead, remember this. Because God has, we know that God will. Because God has, we know that God will. Because God has done this, and because he has done this, although we're here, we know he will do this, and we know he will do this. That should drive our hope. And what I want to finish with today, guys, and I'll pray with you guys, is this. Let hope start rising from within you. <laughs> Take back the very thing that you were promised in Scripture. Hope. Faith, love, and hope. There are better days ahead for you. 
no matter what the circumstance might say, no matter what the politicians might say, no matter what the world might look like, no matter what might come your way, there are better days ahead for you. So in the name of Jesus, start stirring up that hope. Even if it's 1% hope, even if it's 2% hope, if you get a little bit of hope in your life, things are possible. Things can change because you're starting to believe what God and who God is. Let hope rise from within you. And one final thing. This is more like an administrative, maybe it's an administrative pastoral thing. It breaks my heart, that, and the reason why I wanted to share this was because I, I truly, truly believe that believers are called to live this way. And if our life is doing this all the way into eternity, and we're here, but we know that the Lord will lead us eventually, right, to a different time, then we have hope. At the same time, there's people around us whose life is doing this, but they don't have this. I don't know if this is offensive to anybody, but the way it looks, no matter how high or low they might go, it just kind of ends in. And if 2020 is cutting through, they're experiencing a low in their life, and they're looking to the believer. <laughs> They're looking, they're looking around and saying, this is pretty bad. And then they look at the believer and they say, what do you think? And they say, because of the election, this is all going to go sideways. <laughs> what did you give them? Oh, because of the, the, the country or because of this, because of, that's not what you're called to do. <laughs> Stir your heart into the greater hope of Jesus Christ in your life. Stir it, stir it, stir it. Even if it's a little bit now, stir, stir, stir. And let that hope start to rise from within you. Because that'll shape the way you talk. That'll shape the way you behave. Like my friend, no matter how deep the valley gets, you know you will be out of it one day. So your actions reflect that. I'm not panicking. I'm not panicking. Why would I panic? I serve God. God has everything in his hand. He is my pastor, he is my savior, and he always told me in scripture, is my arm too short to deliver you? No, it is not. I will deliver you, and I will lead you exactly to where I told you I'd be leading you. That faith needs to be in us, rising in hope so that our words are reflected appropriately. Our words show that hope. So, because he has, we know that he will. And as I pray it out, I want to ask a question. Today might be the day. I know it was for sure for some people today. Today might be the day. But let me ask a question. How hopeful are you that better days are coming? How hopeful are you? And if you're saying, I'm not hopeful at all, okay, that's a start. Let's start. How hopeful are we that better days are ahead? And right where you are, I want to pray for everybody here today. So can you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as I pray together with you guys, you know. I feel, I feel there's people in this room. This has been a theme in my heart. That's why I shared it with everybody. But I want to be, take a few moments just to say it out loud. There's people in this room who need to hear exactly what I just said. Because God has done that for you, I want you to remember that he will do that again. Because God has shown himself faithful, hear me, in the past, he found you, didn't he? He found you. He delivered you. He gave you his promises. He loves you. Because he has done that, I want you to hear my voice. He will do it again. Because he has been faithful, we know that he is going to be faithful. It's who he is. Our God is faithful. And we must walk knowing that and living that way. So Father God, at this moment, I pray for this congregation that I thank you for this time together in worship and in fellowship, Father, and in teaching, Father. I pray that the scales can be removed from our eyes, Father God, in this moment. Perhaps we've just been wishing for things to get better. Perhaps we've just been 
just desiring different outcomes, Father God, but our eyes have not been on you and your faithfulness, Father. Father, and I pray that today was the day for that to finish, Father God. I pray for the conviction of heart to allow that to finish and to put our eyes firmly on the faithful one who has called us and saved us today. Father, that this body of believers be a body full of hope, be a body that is buoyant, that no matter what happens, we rebound, we're back, we believe. No matter what our circumstances look like, our eyes are on something greater. And we have hope because we know who you are. Father, at this moment, I pray for the church here present. I also pray for those online. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice, as I've been talking, you know, I've just kind of made the assumption like I sometimes do that everybody here is following Jesus and knows who Jesus is. Uh, I, I said that because of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness and we're given the Holy Spirit and we have eternity. Uh, I, I say that broadly, but if you're here under the sound of my voice, I want to be real clear. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus for yourself and your life is away from him and you know what that looks like, then I can't say anything that I just said applies to you. I can't say your life is going to be going in a direction that's hopeful because I can't say, I don't know. So if that's you here today or watching us online and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus and you want to make that decision today or perhaps you did and you want to recommit because you know you've gone astray. Right where you are, can you raise your hand for me in the name of Jesus? Right where you are. Anybody here today? Praise God. Anybody else? Praise God. Anybody else? Nice and high for me to see you guys. Praise God. God loves you here today. God loves you. That's why you're doing it. God loves you. Praise, nice and high for me. Praise God. Online as well, right where you might be. Praise God, praise God, praise God. You can put your hands down. I want to pray a prayer with you guys. Scripture says what you believe in your heart, if you confess with your lips, that's what leads you to salvation. So the prayer that I'm about to pray is not a special prayer. It's not a unique prayer. It's just me giving voice to that. So repeat after me, make it your own. And I want the congregation to pray along with us. So right where you are, nice and loud, repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died for me. At this moment... I ask that you come into my heart and that you save me. Wash all my sins away. Make me brand new. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that because of my confession, I am forgiven. You live in me and heaven is my eternal home. I am saved. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Church, let's give it up for those individuals. Amen. God is so faithful.